Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening for the second program in our third annual virtual genealogy week, What Your Ancestors' Neighbors Can Tell You. I'm Pam Taylor, manager at the Harford County Public Library's Joppa branch. Just a few announcements to share before we get started. This performance is being recorded and will be available along with a handout at hcplonline.org through February the 21st. And if you miss any of our genealogy programs this week, they'll also be available at the website for the next few weeks. Now let's get on with the show. We're thrilled to have Melissa Barker with us this evening. She really has a passion for genealogy. Melissa is a certified archives manager and public historian currently working at the Houston County Tennessee Archives and Museum. She is affectionately known as the archive lady to the genealogy community. She lectures, teaches, and writes about the genealogy research process, researching in archives and records preservation. She conducts virtual presentations across the United States and other countries for various genealogy groups and societies. She writes a popular blog entitled, A Genealogist in the Archives, and is a well-known published book reviewer. She has been a professional genealogist for the past 19 years with expertise in Tennessee records and she has been researching her own family history for the past 33 years. Melissa will be using a PowerPoint during her presentation this evening, and you can adjust what you're seeing on your screen by using the screen view in Zoom. Please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom, and at the end of the show, I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Barker. Thank you, Pam. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good to go. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Get that set up. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much for attending this presentation. I want to thank the Harford uh, Library for inviting me. And we're going to talk about what your ancestors' neighbors can tell you. Um, this is going to be kind of a dual presentation. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of different kinds of records that you might find in archives. And hopefully you're using these records. Um, if you're not, I encourage you to do so. Uh, but also to think about the fact that... Um, maybe the neighbors uh, can tell you about your ancestors. And so you're going to see a lot of uh, visuals in my presentation, like these two here on my uh, first screen. On my first slide, uh, they, the one on the left is actually a photo from the archives where I work. And all of those records there, um, a majority of them are not online. And then the Photograph on the right is actually a neighboring archives in Tennessee, the Dixon County Archives. I took this photograph when I was visiting there. And you're going to hear me say a lot, there's a lot of records not online. And that's because as an archivist, I work in an archives Monday through Friday. I talk to archivists. I visit archives. And majority of our records are not online, uh, even though that there are records coming online every day, we still need to either visit those archives or if we can't visit, we need to talk to them by email, by telephone, by their social media pages, and use their websites. And so let's get started. Your ancestors did not live in isolation. Um, even some of our ancestors that may have lived in a very rural community, they still did not live in isolation. They still interacted with community members. They may have attended school. They may have attended church. Um, they may have had help with their farming. And so sometimes I think genealogists that um, think they can't find any records on their ancestors that, oh, well, they were just a poor dirt farmer. They never talked to anybody, didn't interact with anybody. And really that is not the case. They were normally interacting in their community. So we should be looking at not only records for our own answers, but we should be looking at the neighbor's records and looking to the neighbors to help us guide us to our ancestors. A lot of times that will happen too. Uh, and so this is a, I think a fantastic photograph from the archives where I work. And it shows a home with a couple in front with their baby, uh, probably a traveling photographer who asked them to come out, get their picture and it was saved for uh, history. So I talk a lot about archives all the time. I am an archivist. I'm a genealogist as well. Uh, I, used to, I like to always say that I think all genealogists should be archivists and all archivists should be genealogists. So we could understand each other a lot better. But I want to talk about 
what is an archive? Now, many of you may be thinking, well, I know what an archive is, but I hope that when I get done with this portion of it, that I give you some ideas of where you might be able to find some records. So the Society of American Archivists, their online glossary of terms, and if you're looking for a place to help you with some genealogy and archivist terms, this is a great place to go, defines an archive as an organization that collects the records of individuals, families, and other organizations. Now that's really a broad definition, uh, but any building that collects, preserves, organizes, and takes care of records, whether they be government records, genealogical records, historical records, is an archive. So archives are everywhere. And I like to say that there's an archive for everything. Just when I think I've seen it all, there comes along an archive that is archiving something that I just didn't even think about that could be archived. So their archives are everywhere and we should be using all of these archives to help us with our genealogy research. So I wanna go through some types of archives and hopefully there's gonna be one or two here that you haven't heard of or haven't thought of using for your own genealogy research. So first and foremost, I'll do the one that I work at. I work at a county archive. I work at the Houston County, Tennessee Archives and Museum. And the county archives normally pretty much only manage and preserve and archive the county government records. Now, it may be that that's not all that they do, but for the most part, that's what they do. We're very fortunate here in Tennessee that um, the Tennessee State Library and Archives actually is very instrumental in supporting uh, a county archive in each one of our 95 counties. I think at last count, we have 74 or 75 of those counties have an active operating county archive. And so we're very fortunate in that. Uh, county archives can also collect and preserve historical and genealogical records. Now you see in parentheses I put, but not always, because there are some county archives who st uh, strictly stick with the government records and do not uh, collect the historical and genealogical records. A lot of reason why that is, is because there may be a local museum or a local historical society in the area that does that. So they don't feel like that they need to do that. Well, here where I live in Houston County, I'm it. <laughs> we have a historical society, but they are just a group. They don't have a building. They don't collect records. We meet once a month and have a speaker, but they don't collect records. And so as a county archive, we decided to collect those historical and genealogical records because we wanted to save our history. Uh, there's an example there in that photograph. This is the Erin Rotary Club records. Um, and you may wonder, well, how did you get these records? They were donated by the Erin Rotary Club, which is the local Rotary Club here in Houston County. What happens a lot of times with these civic organizations or social organizations, uh, many of you probably volunteer for one or more of those kinds of organizations, whoever becomes the treasurer or becomes the secretary or even the president, they get handed all of the old records. And a lot of times they don't have a place to put them in their homes. And so these organizations will sometimes donate or turn over their old records to an archive. So if your ancestors were part of a civic or social organization, I would encourage you to look for these kind of records. County archives are a lot of times they're funded by the county government. Uh, they're actually in the county government budget, but also a lot of county archives are also funded not by the county government, but by donations or they do fundraising. Uh, again, a lot of county archives have paid staff and some county archives have nothing but volunteers. So it depends on how they're set up uh, and the support that they get from their local government. County archives should not be confused with other archives or they should not be confused with historical societies or genealogical societies because they are different entities. Uh, and if you think that you've checked at the county archives and you didn't find what you were looking for and you think, well, that's where all the records are, I checked and I'm done, you might wanna look again because there may be other institutions in the area that have records. So another type of archive are historical and genealogical societies. Um, if they have a building, if they're collecting records and they're preserving those records, they are considered an archive. And so in some areas, you're going to have one or the other. I actually actually seen some areas that have both. Uh, and they also i have seen where they have a historical and genealogical society where they've put them together. So it's important that we look at these kinds of societies for records.
They do collect and preserve historical and genealogical records, trying to preserve that local history as well as uh, local family history. Um, this is actually a document from my own genealogy research. Jesse Glasgow is my husband's third great grandfather. Uh, this is a pretty interesting document from 1891 where he paid for a subscription for one share in the Cumberland City Academy. He was a gentleman who was very much a proponent of education. And this is um, a pretty neat document. One thing about historical and genealogical societies is their members can be very knowledgeable about local history and about the local families that have lived there, um, especially if these members have were born and raised in an area or if they've been there for a very long time. Uh, those are the people you want to talk to. And so I have been known to ask the historical or geological society who in your membership has lived here the longest, who has the knowledge of the local history. And so talk to them because you may find information out from them that you may not be able to find in documents. Local public libraries. These are fantastic places for genealogists. Um, I think over time, genealogists have kind of started to overlook public libraries, but they are a great place to do genealogy research and find records. So they may have a separate genealogy room within their library, but they may just have a collection of records set aside for genealogists. Uh, and so look for whatever they may have and talk to them about it. Uh, they may have what are called special collections. Uh, that could be a couple of things. It could be a collection of genealogical reference materials like books and things like that, family histories, or the special collections could actually be manuscript collections, which include actual documents, actual photographs, diaries, scrapbooks, and things like that. So be sure to talk to the public library wherever your ancestors lived and see what kind of genealogical records that they may have. And this is also probably where you're going to find the microfilm readers and microfilm and where you can find newspapers. Uh, many of our local public libraries have genealogical reference materials. And so you might be able to look for those, but they also may have published family histories uh, and some indexed records that you might can look at. Next are state archives. Um, all 50 US states have a state archives. Uh, I like to call these mega archives because they contain records from across the state. A lot of genealogists think that state archives only have records from the areas where their particular archives is located, such as this one. This is the Tennessee State Library and Archives. It's located in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, this photograph is actually from 1953, uh, not soon after this particular building was built. Uh, we now have a new Tennessee State Library and Archives. It's not quite two years old. Uh, fantastic facility, but I also am very uh, attached to this old building as well because I've spent many, many hours here doing research. So first and foremost, they're going to archive the state government records, just like county archives do county government records. The state archives will do the state government records, and so you'll be able to find those here. But they also have county government records. And you may be wondering, how did they get the county government records? Well, if you think about it, uh, many of our counties may not have had an archive or a place to put records or even someone, people who were interested in preserving them. So many times these county government records got transferred to the state archives. So if you can't find what you're looking for at the local level, I would encourage you to go to the state archives level. But state archives also collect historical and genealogical records and artifacts. And so if you're looking for information on your family, the state archives is one of the great places to check and to research in records. I also want to put a plug in for our con uh, con con conservationists, because uh, state archives is a place where records get preserved and conserved. And so it's a great place. So almost all state archives have a, a conservator on staff. Uh, they can't do the work for you of mending your records or whatever needs to be done, but they can be uh, give you advice. And so reach out to them if you have some records that are damaged or need some conservation. University and college libraries and archives. I find that um, genealogists don't think of these as someplace where you might find your family's records. And they actually can be a huge help to you. Uh, they have many of our universities and colleges have libraries and they have archives or they have both. And many times they have more than one on their campuses. Uh, 
And so you might want to check. And it's not a thing of, well, my ancestors didn't go to college. Why would those records be there? Well, you'll find out that they also house local historical and genealogical records. Many times it's because they are part of the community and there was no place else for these records to go. And so they were donated to that university or college. They have these libraries and archives on their campuses. You should not have trouble getting into these facilities. Uh, you may have to have a library card, something like that. I've researched on university and college libraries and archives on their campuses many, many times. Uh, and they're very well represented online as far as websites, social media pages. You should be able to figure out and find out what kinds of records that they have. Uh, this is actually the Pogue Library at Murray State University in Kentucky. Uh, I've done a lot of research in this particular library. I took this photograph. It's a very large room. It's a beautiful room. I was only to get part of it in. But it's one of five libraries actually on Murray State campus. And so um, great place to find all kinds of records. And I was actually, the last time I was there, I was doing newspaper research. Um, they had the Kentucky newspapers on microfilm at this library. Um, they actually receive donations of records, just like a regular archive does. Uh, and so that's why it's important that we look for these records at these institutions. You may be surprised to find your ancestors uh, have records there. And also, if your ancestors did go to college, check those colleges for their records. Um, maybe you, they attended college. Maybe they were a teacher there, a professor there. But if they just lived in the community, their records may have ended up at a college or university library or archive. Museums. Uh, museums are actually a type of archive. I, I kind of came late to the idea of museums as a place where you might could find genealogical records or that you could even do maybe research at museums. Um, they have exhibits and displays. I think many of us have been to many museums of different kinds. But you might have seen a photograph on display. You might have seen an old letter on display or an artifact. Um, I guarantee you that what you see on display, there's probably more located in the back rooms of those museums. I have actually known genealogists to find their ancestor in a photograph on display. And so museums should not be discounted. I like to say that they have a front room and a back room. Their front room is where the exhibits and the displays are located and that we can walk through there and see those. But if you ever got a peek at their back rooms, their back rooms look exactly like a regular archives stacks. They have shelves full of boxes, full of records. And so we need to be thinking about our museums. This is one of my favorite museums. This is the Williamson County Museum and Archives in Tennessee. They have absolutely fantastic exhibits and displays like the one there at the top, but their back room looks like the bottom photograph. They have boxes full of records for researchers. Um, they could contain records in their back rooms that are not on display. And so it's important that we, um, in any archive, that we develop a relationship, that we talk to them, that we let them know how serious we are about our genealogy so that we might can gain access to those records. Let me go back to museums. I want to say one more thing. Museums will probably be one of the hardest places that you'll find to gain access to records. Museum curators are very protective of their records. They don't normally have research rooms where like a, a normal library or an archives has. And so, but I don't want you to give up. I don't want you to think that you can't gain access. Talk to them about your research, tell them how serious you are and ask them what they might have. And they may open up their records to you. Um, another type of archive that I think genealogists don't think about are church archives. Now, I don't know about you, but I also contact the actual church where my ancestors went to church, um, if it still exists. I did contact a church in Wyandotte County, Ohio, because my ancestors that moved there in 1854, I had information that they had helped to establish a particular church. So I wrote the churches was still uh, open, still going strong. So I wrote a letter actually to the church secretary and unbeknownst to me, the church secretary that got my letter was a distant cousin in the same family. And so she sent me a huge package of information about the church and my ancestors involvement in that church. And she also took photographs of the wooden pulpit that they still use today because my ancestor actually built it. So fantastic way to get some information. 
But church archives are normally organized by denomination or type of religion, just like this one. This is the historical foundation of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church and the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in America in Cordova, Tennessee. This is just outside of Memphis. Susan Knight Gore, who's actually a really good friend of mine, is the archivist here. And so if you're looking at this and you're thinking, I've got Cumberland Presbyterian ancestors, but they were never in Tennessee. Well, I can tell you that Susan and her husband, Matthew, actually get in their vehicle and they travel from state to state, church to church, picking up the records from the uh, churches and bringing it back to this archive. And so you need to be looking at this archive if you do have Cumberland Presbyterian Church ancestors. So church archives are going to have records from the local church at one facility under that denomination or type of religion. Now, don't forget that individual churches could still have their own archive or just have their records in the church office. And so we still need to contact them to see if they have anything there. Also, keep in mind that maybe the pastor, the church leader, the Sunday school teacher took records home. And I learned this uh, very quickly when I received a donation of records from uh, Laura and her sister, uh, their last name is Knight. And they had, they were school teachers here, they were twins, and they were school teachers here for decades. So when their records were donated to our archive, as I was going through them, I found a couple of Sunday school church uh, ledgers that listed the members of the Sunday school class. And so you never know where you're going to find church records, school records, in something like that. Another wonderful uh, church archive is the Southern Baptist Historical Library and Archives. It's located in Na downtown Nashville, Tennessee. I've been there many times. And if you have Southern Baptist, this is a fantastic place to get some information. I've actually researched uh, individuals that didn't live in Tennessee, but had a Southern Baptist background, and I was able to find some records there for my, some, one of my clients. Regional archives. Um, regional archives are kind of special uh, and they're not talked about a lot, but they contain records for a particular region, uh, which encompasses more than one state, more than one county. Uh, these particular type of archives will highlight a particular culture in that region. And you're going to see an example here and probably understand that more. So their archives and the area that they cover encompasses more than one state. It could encompass more than one county in a state. Uh, again, it's a regional archives. And so this is a great example of that. This is the archives of the Appalachia. Uh, and so as if you know anything about the Appalachia region, you know that it encompasses more than the state of Tennessee. And so that is what they're doing at this archive. Uh, this archive is actually located at the East Tennessee State University and has fantastic records on the culture of the Appalachian region, the people, how they lived, uh, where they lived, and a great place to uh, learn about that particular culture. And the last one I'm going to talk about is ethnic archives. Um, again, this is another type of archive that many genealogists may not think about or know that they exist. And so they collect and archive records for a particular race of people. And we have several of these in the United States and also across the globe. They actually concentrate on the history, the culture, and the lives of a particular ethnic group. Uh, so if you are researching your, the ethnicity of your ancestors and you want to know more about their culture, their history, how they lived, what were some of the things that they were known for as the, for their ethnic group? Great places to look for that kind of information. Uh, ethnic archives are usually learning centers uh, for the many diverse groups of people that we have in our ancestry. It's a couple of examples of this type of archive. This is one, the Museum of the Cherokee Indian in Cherokee, North Carolina. If you have Cherokee Indian, maybe you want to check this out, look to see what kind of records that they have, and uh, do some research uh, on your Cherokee Indian heritage there. And this is, I would say, probably one of our newest, which is it's, it's a little few years old, but one of our newest ethnic archives. This is the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's located in Washington, D.C. I've not had the privilege yet to um, visit this particular museum and archive yet. It, it opened just before COVID. And so, but I have heard some fantastic things about this particular archive. Uh, and so if you're ever in the Washington, D.C. area, please go visit this archive. 
So those are some examples of some archives. Uh, I could go on and on about archives. There are all kinds of different archives, but I hope I whetted your appetite and you've written down a couple of type of archives you need to go check out. So records could literally be anywhere. Um, being a genealogist for 33 years, I have had to look for records in some really interesting places. And being an archivist, when our, uh, records are donated to me, the stories that I get about where these records were located, where they were being stored, is very interesting. And so records can be anywhere. So that's why I tell genealogists, if you think you're done with your genealogy, or if you think, I've checked everywhere, there, there's just nothing else to be found. Just wait a little while because there is always a house being cleaned out. There's always an estate sale. There's always things being found. And then I hope people will donate these to archives. And so I have people walking into my archives almost on a daily basis, donating stuff. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if you've already been to my archive and you've done research and you think you're done, well, give it a few weeks and there may be more records that come into my archive. And maybe there's something in that donation that is pertaining to your family. So that's why it's important that we should always keep our, keep our eyes and ears open for what records are becoming available. So records can be anywhere. Uh, how about the local historian's home? Uh, this is actually, uh, Nina Finley was our local county historian for decades, and she unexpectedly passed away in 2014. A few weeks later, I get a phone call from her son asking me if I would like to have all of her research records that were in her attic. So this is the photograph of when he brought those records. What I didn't know is that it would take two truckloads for them to get to the archive. Uh, we were very grateful to get these records. As you can see, uh, this is what I call fresh from the attic. They're still in their original boxes. Uh, since we received these records, we have actually reboxed them into archival boxes and we have done an inventory of them. It's great records, local history, family history, and they were all donated. How about the local antique store? Uh, this particular book I actually saw at a local antique store. And it was a ledger book for a local store or a mercantile dating from the 1800s. And I asked the owners, I said, why don't you donate this to the archive or get it preserved in some way? And what it was is it belonged to their family. And so they had it on display at their local store. So, and I get that. Uh, but looking for these records, like I said, can be anywhere. So if you're looking at a ledger for a local mercantile, local store from the 1800s, you could find your ancestor in there and you could see what they bought and sold uh, and you're putting them in a time and a place. And so great records. Online auction sites. Um, I am continually scouring eBay. Um, there's some local people who will put things on Facebook that they are selling. And so I'm constantly looking online auction sites for anything having to do with where I live because being the archivist here, I'm constantly trying to find records for our archives, but you can do the same. I have things set up on eBay where it is looking for different surnames that I research and I get notifications, email notifications about that. And every once in a while, something pops up, a document, a photograph, and I get to bid on that and hopefully win it. So great places to find records. Again, they can be anywhere. Personal papers. Um, this is what I talk about when, you know, records are donated all the time. Uh, because when people pass away, their families clean out their homes and they don't know what to do with this stuff. Hopefully they don't throw it away and they donate it. And so we get photographs. Uh, recently, I've received a large scrapbook. I've received two photo albums. I've received a big envelope full of uh, photographs. And they just walk in the door and they say, do you want this stuff? So personal papers are a great place to find genealogical records. So where do we start? Where do we start when it comes to doing our geology research, finding records, and working with the neighbors to try to use their records to find our ancestors? So I always tell people to get locally specific. Uh, get down to the city, to the community, to the county. Uh, here is a county map of Maryland. So if I was doing research in Maryland, which I actually have a little bit of Maryland research that I have done in the past in Baltimore and Baltimore City, um, you need to get locally specific. I mean, what do you do? Well, you look to see what archives are available, what historical societies are available, what libraries, what institutions, what repositories that might have records. 
So we need to locate and document all of these places um, and get their email addresses, see if they have a website, do they have social media accounts, because you're going to want to communicate. Um, I don't live anywhere near uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And so when I was researching this particular ancestor of my husband's, he had actually been brought up on charges of murder in 1890. He actually did it on New Year's Eve of 1889. Uh, and so I actually did most of the legwork from here. Um, I contacted uh, court systems, I contacted uh, historical societies, and I actually contacted a researcher in the area that helped get me some records. So you, it can be done from a distance. Spend some time talking to the local historian, uh, the local librarian. I've actually been known to even call up the Chamber of Commerce and say, who is one of the oldest people in your community? Um, and I can get their information, I can talk to them and ask them the question, where are the records? Uh, because if you talk to people at the courthouse, uh, people who are dealing in these records on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of times they don't know where the records are located, especially if they're in an abandoned building somewhere. So you talk to those that have lived there a long time, they're going to know where the records are located. I encourage you to locate and bookmark any of these archives websites, uh, their social media pages, and so that way you can find them easily, ask questions. Um, one thing about doing research from a distance, a lot of times you have to wait longer to get the records, so you have to be patient, and I don't know very many genealogists that are patient that way. <laughs> so let's go to the next level. You've gone local, you've gone to the community, you've gone to the little small cities, so the next level for me is to go to the state archives. And so not all, when all the local archives have been scoured, you've uh, talked to them, maybe if you're able to visit them, you've looked at their websites, you've looked at their indexes, maybe they have some digitized records, you've looked at those, then you need to kind of go to the next level. And for me, those are state archives. Uh, and so, like I said, all 50 US states have a state archives, which is fantastic. And all 50 US state archives have a website. And so we should be looking at those websites. They, um, I can tell you that more and more records have come online on these state archives. And they have indexes, they have finding aids, they have some digitized records. Um, and so go there and look for those. But state archives might also be able to help you to find smaller archives in those communities that you're looking at that you couldn't find before. Uh, or maybe they know about the local historical society. So talk to them about what other repositories that they would suggest that you go to. And again, this is where records preservation and conservation is handled is at the state archive level. So let's talk about researching in the records of the neighbors. Um, one thing about my genealogy research is that I, my family just did not leave very much for me as a genealogist. Um, I don't have old letters. I don't have any scrapbooks. I don't have any diaries. <laughs> um, I don't really have a whole lot of photographs. And so I've had to scrounge and do my research from scratch. And that includes finding records at archives. And so Hopefully, if you have been lucky enough that your ancestors left or your family members left you a lot of these types of records, um, be blessed and feel like you're blessed because there's a lot of us out there that wish we had those kind of records. First and foremost, I would encourage you to go to manuscript collections. Um, manuscript collections, this is how I describe a manuscript collection. I have genealogists ask me all the time, what are manuscript collections? I want you to think about all of the genealogical records that you have. Uh, so you have documents, you've got photographs, uh, maybe you have a scrapbook, a diary, you've got the quilt that your grandmother made, you have a lock of hair from someone in the family, um, all kinds of things. Well, take all those items, put them in a box, and drive down to the local archive and donate it. That is a manuscript collection. So that right there will tell you that you can literally find just about anything in a manuscript collection. I honestly believe that the manuscript collections are one of the under, number one, underutilized records collections by genealogy research. And yes, that's my opinion. But working with genealogists for as long as I have, many times when I bring up this type of collection, they've never even heard of it. Uh, and so it's important that we look at all collections when we're doing our genealogy research. 
They can be a true gold mine of genealogical and historical records. Um, and especially if you're looking for your ancestors, they don't have a manuscript collection, but maybe someone in the community, their neighbor, someone they went to church with has this type of a collection. And why are we looking at the neighbor's records? Well, you'll see here in a minute. We wanna look behind those closed doors. When you go to an archive, any kind of archive, you have to sit in a research area where there's some tables and chairs, maybe some reference books on the shelf, but you're not seeing the full collections of what they have. And so I always encourage genealogists to ask for a tour of the facility, uh, especially the back rooms where you get to see the shelves full of boxes, full of records. Ask the archivist for the tour. Now, I would, I would suggest you email in advance, ask for a tour for when you get there. But you need to know what's behind those closed doors because that's what you're going to know, what kind of collections they have, what particular records that they have. I love going on tours of archives, and I, when I do research, I always ask for a tour of the archives. Mansion collections have a document associated with each collection, and it's called the finding aid. The finding aid is going to be your roadmap to know what's in that collection. So a finding aid is a document that is produced by the archivist as they process the collection. And what I mean by process the collection is that they, when they get the collection in, they have to go through it. They have to clean it if any of the records are dirty. They have to unfold letters and unfold things and flatten them because we like everything as flat as possible. We remove any hazards, meaning we move staples, paper clips, and binding clips, things like that. And then we put these records in file folders and in boxes, and then they're ready for the researcher. And along the way, we produce a finding aid. So here is an example of the content section of a finding aid. To me, that's the most important part. I encourage you to read the entire finding aid, but the contents listing is going to give you that folder by folder, box by box listing of what is exactly in the collection. So this is the Marie Stockard manuscript collection. Marie Stockard was a local lady here. Her records were donated to the archive. There was a lot of correspondence. There was a lot of different kinds of records. And so here is part of the uh, contents listing. And so you'll see folder seven has correspondence from 1925. And then it lists, there's a letter to parents from Talmadge uh, and it's dated May 25th, 1925. And you can see the rest of the listing there. Now, what's different from my finding aids as opposed to a lot of other archives finding aids is that I think it's because I'm a genealogist <laughs> and I think like a genealogist. Uh, most finding aids, the only thing you're going to see probably it says folder seven correspondence 1925. That's usually all you get because they don't take the time to list everything that's in the folders. It is time consuming. But knowing genealogists like I do, my finding aids are a little more detailed because I want to give the genealogist more information. So what can be found in manuscript collections? Well, diaries are a great thing to find. And like I said, look for those neighbors' diaries. They may have talked about your ancestor. Old letters uh, can be in manuscript collections, family genealogies, per personal papers, business records, school records but especially original documents. And your ancestor can be in manuscript collections, whether they have one of their own or they're mentioned in a neighbor's manuscript collection. And so there's just tons of stuff. I would encourage you if you've never done research in manuscript collections to start looking for them. Uh, start reading those finding aids and start requesting the records that are located in these types of records. Uh, vertical files. Um, I would encourage you if you've never looked into vertical files to do so. So what are vertical files? Um, vertical files are actually a, col a collection of miscellaneous documents, ephemera, and sometimes photographs that archives collect. Uh, these are records that are donated again, or they're found, they are not a ton of records, so they don't go into a manuscript collection. Uh, and then they are filed in filing cabinets and in file folders. Uh, normally, uh, they have filing cabinets and then these file folders, and they are organized by surname or subject name. So they're very easy to find your surname. Uh, there should be an index either on the archives website and in an on an in-house computer, or maybe they just have a paper index that you have to ask for. But you look at the index, look for your surnames, ask for those files to be pulled and brought to you, and then look to see what's in them. Uh, I like to say vertical files are kind of like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get because you don't. 
you may get a family group sheet. You may get a, a, an actual birth certificate that's sitting in there. I've seen copies of Bible, those genealogy Bible pages. You just don't know what you're going to get. They truly are a hodgepodge of records. But one of these vertical files may have that piece of information that you are needing or looking for. Now, some uh, archives, their vertical files are mainly composed of newspaper clippings. Uh, and so you may be thinking, but I can see the newspaper on microfilm. Well, I don't know about you, but there have been more than once that I have looked at newspapers on microfilm. And just when I get to that newspaper, that data, that newspaper that I need, that particular newspaper is missing from the microfilm. It just was not saved. So maybe I can go to the vertical files, look at their newspaper clippings and find what I'm looking for. So what kinds of things can be found in vertical files? Uh, newspaper clippings. Obviously, that's one of the number one things the archivists put in vertical files, but there could be family histories. And I encourage genealogists to donate their family histories uh, to archives. Family group sheets can be in there. Just make sure you put your contact information on there. So if another genealogist comes by, sees your family group sheet, wants to make a connection, they'll have your contact information. Uh, donated miscellaneous tidbits, photographs. Now, this could be um, in vertical files or not. It depends on the archivist and how they decide to do things. I have seen photographs in vertical files, but I've also seen archives where they took all of the photographs together and put them in one big photograph collection. So you'll need to figure that out with whatever archives you're working with. Uh, copies of family Bible pages can be in there. I have found those. And records for your ancestors, either their own, your own surname file or they could be mentioned in records uh, from the neighbors. Uh, from the local clergy who maybe married them, things like that. So we need to be on the lookout for not only our ancestors' records that they produced, but our ancestors being mentioned in someone else's records because it does happen. Diaries and journals. Um, again, my family did not leave me any diaries and journals. I hope some of you have diaries and journals because I love reading these types of records. So they're a fantastic source to locate genealogical and historical information, uh, family stories, things you're not going to find in some other record sources and government records can be found in diaries and journals. Uh, they will be found in manuscript collections. Many times these diaries and journals are donated with a whole collection of uh, records, either personal papers or family records. And so you're going to find them in manuscript collections. They should be listed on the finding aid specifically. They're almost always donated to archives. Uh, and so ask the archivist, say, do you have any diaries and journals for this area? Uh, again, if you don't find one for your own ancestor, read the neighbor's diaries and journals because they talked about their neighbors more than you think they did. Uh, they could be mentioned, uh, your ancestor could be mentioned in any of these diaries and journals written by locals. And so I, that's one of the number one record sources that I encourage genealogists to look for your ancestor, especially if you don't have diaries or journals for your ancestor. And this is a perfect example. Uh, many of you may know the show, Who Do You Think You Are? Well, in season two, they did Tim McGraw's uh, genealogy. And Tim McGraw's ancestor, whose name was Jost Height, was mentioned in 16-year-old George Washington's diary. Yes, that, that George Washington. And the reason he was mentioned in George Washington's diary, and he was only mentioned once, was because Joe's height was a neighbor to George Washington. Now, George Washington's everything, his documents, his diaries, everything has pretty much been indexed and digitized. And so it may have been a fairly easy thing to find. So it may not be quite as easy for you, but it's well worth digging. And so just because Joe's height was a neighbor to George Washington, George Washington mentioned him in his diary about something that they interacted about. This is um, a diary. This is a different kind of diary, actually. This is the diary we have in our archives. This is uh, Priestley Clark is his name, and he actually produced work diaries. He had two of them that we received from 1933 and 1934. He worked for the Ellen N. Railroad, which is the Louisville and Nashville Railroad that came through our area here in Tennessee. And he didn't put a whole lot in his diaries, but what he did do is he would put down where he went for work that day and um, the actual city and what he was doing. 
Uh, and so I find this pretty interesting. I've never seen a work diary like this. I've seen many other diaries, but this is an interesting one for me. What if this was your ancestor? Wouldn't it be neat to know on a daily basis what he was doing? Uh, and also in this dryer, he mentioned fellow co-workers. So when we talk about looking for records um, through the neighbor's records, think about co-workers. Co-workers could have mentioned your ancestors in some of their documents, uh, maybe in their work diary and things like that. Correspondence. Um, you know, we do a lot of emailing now. We do a lot of texting now. I'm afraid all of that's probably going to go away. It will not be preserved. But back in the day, there was letter writing. And so maybe you have letters like this for your ancestors. But a lot of these types of records are in archives. And if you can't find for some for your ancestor, read the letters of the neighbors, of the community members, to see if maybe your ancestors were mentioned. And so old letters and postcards can be a treasure trove for us as genealogists. It takes time to read them. Maybe they're not all digitized. But getting the sense of the information that you can find, but also you can read about events that happened in the community. So you may not have actual letters from your ancestor, but you can read about these events that, that obviously your ancestor experienced because they lived in the community as well. Correspondence, old letters, postcards are going to be found in manuscript collections or vertical files, depending on how many there are. If it's a large collection of correspondence, then you're definitely going to find them in the manuscript collection. If there's only one or two letters that were donated, they may be in the vertical files. Uh, and so just check those finding aids and check those indexes to look for this correspondence. Again, these are almost always donated to archives. Um, we get letters and things donated all the time. And when they get donated, I almost always have to immediately sit down and read them because I just love reading old letters. These old letters could mention your ancestors, just like the diaries. Um, look for your ancestors in the old letters of neighbors, of those that lived in the communities. Uh, a lot of times I get discouraged when I can't find these kinds of records for my ancestors, but then I remember I need to read the neighbor's mail. <laughs> so when you're looking at a archive uh, where your ancestors lived and you can't find what you're looking for for your ancestors, ask the archivist, say, what kind of things do you have for those in the community for the time period that my ancestor was living? Uh, and so start reading those letters, start looking at those diaries. Loose records. Uh, these are some fantastic documents. A lot of these are not digitized and online. And so it may be that you have to actually go to an archive or talk to them about what they have. But they are found in almost every archive. And once I start explaining this to you, you probably will realize, oh, yeah, I've done some research in some of those. Uh, this photograph, actually, I'll stop here and talk about it, um, are some loose school records. Uh, these were found at our local school board and they, they gave them to us and they, they back to the 1800s all the way up to the 1980s and this is how they came just in these boxes just all kinds of correspondence receipts invoices information about students and teachers uh, and so fantastic for us to get those loose records are considered working papers or accompanying papers Two records that are recorded in bound volumes. Now, many of us have done research in bound volumes, such as marriage records, court records, probate records. Well, did you know that maybe there were loose records associated with what you found in those bound volumes? They will be archived separate from the bound volumes. And so if you find something in a bound volume, you may need to ask or talk to the archivist about, hey, do you have any loose records associated with this case? Uh, in the court records or probate, things, something like that. One thing about the loose records that I have found over the years is that they contain additional information not found in the bound record. So for instance, let's say you find a court case in a bound volume. And a lot of times these court cases are written out in the bound volume, but it may just be a synopsis or it may be a short version the loose court case files may contain the actual affidavits and subpoenas and witness statements, things like that. So that's why these loose records are so very important. So what collections or bound volumes might have loose records associated with them? Well, obviously the court records, uh, those are fantastic records, but marriage records could actually have some loose records 
We have a collection of loose marriage records with our uh, archives. They contain things like parent letters giving permission for marriage. They contain other records and documents, maybe even a copy of the marriage license. Uh, the one that you probably know best are probate records or probate packets. Uh, these are records that are associated with an estate and they will have all kinds of records associated to what you find in the will book. You may find the will listed and written out in a will book, but you need to ask about probate records because if the estate was probated, there'll be a lot more records associated with that. Deed records could also have some loose records associated with it. And then manuscript collections and vertical files are also considered a type of loose record. So we want to find all the records that we can in any archive. Um, scrapbooks. I have to bring up scrapbooks because I love scrapbooks. I've been known to actually travel to go look at scrapbooks, even if they have nothing to do with my family. So, but again, these are usually donated to an archive. Um, I love scrapbooks. They're individual. They're unique because they were put together by an individual person. And so there isn't a scrapbook that is the same. Um, they are one of a kind. And they usually have things pasted into them, obviously, but they could have some journaling in them as well. This is actually one of my favorite things that I have ever found in a scrapbook. This is Evelyn Ellis's scrapbook from the 1930s. It was actually found up in a closet at a house during an auction of the stuff in that house. And someone wanted to buy it at the auction, but the people who were selling, doing the auction said, no, 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 we're going to donate this to the archive. So it came to me. But this is a Baby Ruth candy bar wrapper, and you can't tell in this photograph, but it's about three times larger than the Baby Ruth candy bar wrapper today. And she journals about it, which is very cool. It says, always remember June 11th, 1938 at Beach Grove at the Ice Cream Supper. This is not my ancestor, but if it was, I would be over the moon if I found something like this. They could contain anything. I have actually seen original birth certificates pasted into scrapbooks. I've seen original death certificates. I've seen locks of hair pasted. I've seen all kinds of stuff in scrapbooks. And so when you go to an archive, if they don't have a scrapbook for your ancestor, look at the neighbor's scrapbooks. They may have pasted a newspaper clipping in there about your ancestor. Maybe they journaled something in there about your ancestor because they had some sort of an event that you were that they were together, they talked or something happened. These again are going to be archived with manuscript collections and in that finding aid, it should mention or list that there is a scrapbook. So what kind of nuggets can we find in scrapbooks? Original records. Believe it or not, I have seen tons of original records pasted into scrapbooks. Uh, newspaper clippings. A lot of times you have scrapbooks that are nothing but newspaper clippings, which could be a benefit to you if you can't find information on your ancestor look at these scrapbooks. There may be newspaper clippings in there from lost newspapers that were not saved, that were not microfilmed or digitized, but that clipping is in that scrapbook. Um, I've seen old letters, greeting cards with names and addresses. Maybe your ancestors sent a greeting card to someone in the community and you can find their name and address on it. Family photographs, uh, original, even old, old, old photographs I've seen pasted into scrapbooks. And again, the for me, the icing on the cake is if whoever put the scrapbook together wrote about memories, journaled, put family stories in there, talked about your ancestor in there. Uh, again, remember, your ancestor was part of a community. And so they did interact with those in the community. The, you may not have records from your ancestor that indicates that, but it's you live in a community today. You interact with those in your community on whatever level that is. So remember that your ancestor did the same thing. And that's why we need to be looking at these records with a different vision. Yes, look for our ancestors, but then start looking at those records that their community members and their neighbors produced as well. School records. Um, school records are fantastic, um, even if your ancestor didn't go to school, and we'll talk about that. So school records can be found at local archives, all of the different archives that I mentioned. Maybe Don't forget military academies and private schools. They can be available, just like this school picture. Uh, I love these old school pictures like this. This is from 1950s at one of the schools here in our county. 
they're not widely available a lot of times. It depends on the community, depends on the school board, it depends on what was saved and what was not saved. Uh, and it also depends on the who knows where they're located. <laughs> Remember me talking about asking in the community, where are the records? Many people may not know where they're at, but they hopefully is one person who does. So it depends on what was saved. We are very lucky here in Houston County, Tennessee, that our school board kind of forgot about some records from where they were until they wanted to use that building. And then they called me and they said, hey, we need to get rid of these records. So when I went there, there was about 25 filing cabinets filled with school registers. Now the school registers are those registers that the teacher kept uh, year after year and has the student's name in it, their grades, um, their address where they live, the name of their parents, all kinds of fantastic information. And these school regist registers dated back to about the 1920s. Uh, and so fantastic. And the school board's like, just get rid of them or we're going to throw them away. So we transfer them to the archives. So we're very fortunate to have those. Sometimes these records can be harder to track down, uh, especially if the school doesn't exist anymore. And so maybe they threw the records away, uh, but keep checking. If you check with the school board, which is where I would first send you to, keep in mind that they're doing the work of today. They're trying to help people with their children that are in schools today. So they may not want to give you the time that you want. Uh, and so don't fault them for that. Um, try to reach out to a historical society member, ask them. Say, do you know of any school records that might be in this area and maybe they know where they're located? School records help to tell your ancestor's story. I've had genealogists tell me, I don't really care about school records. I don't want to know my ancestor's grades. They can tell you more than just your ancestor's grades. Uh, and so it's important that we look at every resource available to us to get information. And it could mention your ancestors who didn't go to school. Uh, people, when I read that, they go, wait a minute, but my ancestor didn't go to school. How in the world do they have school records? Here is a perfect example. Um, this is actually a little invoice or receipt dated August the 30th, 1941. And it says, please pay Conley Stringfield four days at $3 per day, $12 for building cabinets at Stewart School in the home economic room. Well, I can tell you that Conley Stringfield didn't go to school a day in his life. Very intelligent man, uh, had his own business, uh, but he did not go to public school. And I can tell you that because this is my husband's grandfather and I knew him. He died in 2001 uh, and I knew him for many years. He was an excellent uh, carpenter and very intelligent man, but he didn't go to school. But this particular document is in the school records. Now, what was very poignant about this document is that this is dated before his daughter was born, which was my mother-in-law. And when I found this document, which is always great to work in an archive where your husband's family's from, so I run across documents all the time. But when I found this document and shared this with her, she almost came to tears because she actually went to the Stewart School. She did not know that her father had built the cabinets in the home economic room. And so when I found this, it was already years after he had passed. So yes, you can find school records for those who didn't go to school, but may have school records. Maybe they drove the school bus. Maybe they chopped wood for the one room schoolhouse or carried coal there uh, or donated the land for the school. So we need to be looking in the school board minutes and other school records for not only those that went to school, but those who didn't go to school. So what kind of school records can we maybe find, depending on what was saved? Um, student attendance records, student grades, uh, school board minutes. If you can get a hold of some school board minutes, um, that's where you're going to find those ancestors that maybe didn't go to school, but you may find a lot more in there. If your ancestor was a teacher, they're going to be in those school board minutes because it seems like every year they always talked about who they hired for the year. Teacher contracts. Bus driver contracts, again, another place, those bus driver contracts to find your ancestors who didn't go to school. And information about local schools. One of the things that I do is that when I find out what school one of my ancestors went to, I tend to research that school and see if I can find a photograph of it or find out where it was located and, you know, the history of it. So looking for your ancestors in school records um, is a great place to look. Voting and election records. Um, again, another type of record that we should be using. So they're also found in archives, 
but it depends on what's been saved. Again, unfortunately, a lot of records get thrown out, but hopefully some are forgotten about and they get saved. Again, just like school records, the availability of these records will depend on what was saved at the local level. So you need to study your, the state's retention schedule wherever you're researching. And what is a retention schedule? That is the laws that tells local records managers how long they need to keep records. Um, are they permanent records? Are they temporary records? Do they only keep them for five years and then they can be destroyed? Things like that. And so that will tell you what needs to be kept and what doesn't need to be kept. Uh, unfortunately, um, this is what happens. We can't keep it all. We don't have room to keep it all. And so some things by the state laws can be destroyed and they get destroyed. Uh, but there are some, the majority of the historical and government records will be kept. And like I said, if they're forgotten about or if they just want to be handed over to the local archive or historical society, they get preserved that way. Some types of voting records that you might want to find is the poll tax. Now, surely we all know about the poll tax. Um, it is a type of voting record because you had to pay your poll tax to be able to vote. Now, poll taxes, of course, are in the tax records, but it's something uh, having to do with voting. Voter registration list, you might be able to locate election results, which you can find those in the newspapers as well. Maybe you had an ancestor that ran for office and you didn't know about it. I ran across my husband's grandfather who ran for highway uh, commissioner, and I didn't know that he ran for highway commissioner. I ran across it in the newspaper. So maybe your ancestor worked as a poll worker. Um, we have poll workers today, and so maybe they worked as a poll worker and you can find that information in the voting records. And again, maybe they ran for office, uh, candidate records, um, or voting district changes. A lot of times that will help you also with land records or property records if you know that the voting district had changed. A lot of uh, places will redistrict, uh, and that gets changed over time. And photographs. Most all archives have photographs. Um, and so look for photographs from your ancestors. Look for photographs of your ancestors that maybe are in the neighbor's photograph collection, because maybe they were part of the same local home demonstration club, or maybe they were part of the Lions Club, or some local club that maybe they have a group photo. So that's why we want to look in all of these records. So almost all archives have uh, collections of photographs. So these photographs could be people. Uh, places in the community, buildings in the community, the schools, churches, and even photographs of events that happen. So if you're going to an archive and you're looking at their photograph collections, and they have collections of events that happened in past years, maybe your ancestor attended one of those events and they got them on a photograph. So that's why it's important that we look for these things. So manuscript collections and vertical files we've already talked about could include photographs. I've seen one of two ways, either archivists will leave the photographs with these collections or they will take all the photographs out and put them in one big photograph collection. Uh, it just depends on the archivist. Most importantly, unidentified photographs. We all have them in our archives because they're donated, there's no names on them and they are listed as unidentified. If you have photographs of your ancestors, Bring them with you when you come to the archives um, because you may be able to identify some of our unidentified photographs and we would love you for that <laughs> because we are constantly wanting to identify our photographs uh, and so ask about unidentified photographs look at them maybe you will recognize your ancestors in them Unprocessed records, I believe this is the last one. Um, I kind of get in trouble with other archivists on this one because all archives have unprocessed records. What are unprocessed records? These are the records that have been donated to the archive and are sitting on shelves waiting to be processed. And I told you about processing, what that means. And they sit there and they could sit there for years. Well, what if you're looking for something that's in one of those boxes about your ancestor? Um, ask about unprocessed records. Now, you may not get access to them. You may be told that we don't allow researchers to look at our unprocessed records. But I encourage you to ask anyway, because you just never know um, if you get access to them. So these are the backlog records that they have not gotten to yet. And like I said, they could sit there for years before they get um, processed. 
if you ask about these records, and even if they don't let you have access about them, I would encourage you to continue to ask about them because it may move those records, especially if you're showing interest, up the scale to the top and get processed. Uh, and then again, that you may bug them enough that they may let you look at those records. Um, I let genealogists look at my unprocessed records. And I think it's because I am a genealogist. Uh, and so ask about them. All they can do is say no. Uh, again, keep checking back with the archives. Records are donated every day. You may have find something that's been donated in the last few weeks that you've been looking for. So behind closed doors. Most records and archives are behind closed doors. And so we need to be talking to the archivist and finding out what they have. Really the, the area where you're sitting is normally a small area. Um, and so uh, the research area only has a small number of genealogical records, maybe some reference genealogy books uh, on the shelves. The majority of what you're gonna wanna look at is gonna be in those back rooms. Talk to the archivist about your specific records requests. And I underline specific because um, we're working with many people on a daily basis and we appreciate your genealogy research, but we don't want to hear the three hour, this is the history of my family. We want to know what do you need? What are you looking for? I'll help you. And so try to be as specific as you can with your request. And try to build a relationship with the archives and the archivists, especially if you are researching in an area where your ancestors have lived for a very long time and you know you're going to access a lot of different records and you're going to be doing research there for a long time. I have a family I mentioned earlier that uh, moved to Wyandotte County, Ohio in 1854. That family lived there forever. <laughs> it's like they never ever moved until like the 20th century. And so the records there are voluminous. And so I am very nice to everyone that I talk to. I have developed a relationship with many of these archivists, librarians, historical society members, um, and they and reciprocate by sending me records, especially when something new is donated or they are processing records and they've run across something and they go, oh, this is Melissa's family. Archivists remember surnames. They remember researchers that come in and they remember what they're working on. Not everybody, but most. And so if we run across something, I have been known to contact them and say, hey, you were here last year and we've just found these records. Would you be interested in them? Um, I always talk about records not being online, but there are some great places to go online and find records. Um, go to those state archives websites and get what I call click happy. My husband says that when he's trying to help me with something computer wise, I get click happy. But I give you permission to get click happy on these websites. I don't know why, but archivists make it difficult for us to find things on their websites. Uh, it's like peeling an onion. You have to keep clicking and digging to find things. But I promise you, you'll be rewarded. You'll find some indexes, finding aids, and maybe even some digitized records. Use that search feature. It's not foolproof, but it will help you. And go to the collections catalog and look at the collections that they have uh, and then search from there. Use the Ask the Archivist or Ask the Librarian button. Um, uh, since COVID, it seems like that they are answering a lot quicker. Uh, and so that's a good thing. And so, but use that button. Uh, you may have to be a little patient, but um, I encourage you to use it if it's there. And then use the websites that many archives share their information on, such as finding aids, indexes, and scanned images. And those are things like um, Archive Grid or Internet Archive, um, WorldCat, things like that. So lastly, your reality check for today is statistics say that only 5 to 10% of all genealogical records are online. Um, I even think it's less than that. Uh, so, but that means that 90 to 95% of the world's genealogical records are sitting on sh in boxes and shelves at archives that you need to be discovering. And so remember, it's an all online contact or visit an archive today. Thank you so very much for attending this presentation. Please visit my blog at Genealogists in the Archives, or you can find me on Facebook. Just look for The Archive Lady. And after this presentation, if you have any other questions, please email me. Uh, my email is actually on the handout. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to see if we have any questions. We certainly do have a couple of questions for you. So I'm going to start with this one. I contacted at the church where my grandparents attended, and I didn't receive anything from them. Is there a particular person who the letter should be addressed to? 
I think I had contacted them through their website. Um, well, I was, uh, you know, you might could address it to the secretary, but one thing I would also encourage people, if you are contacting a church, an archive, or any place, and you don't hear anything, um, give it an, enough amount of time, and then contact them again. Contacting someone through their website, um, it could have gotten lost, and maybe never even got to them. Uh, maybe they get lots of requests, and it got buried. So don't be afraid to contact them again. Pretty good. Um, these are two questions that are kind of related, so I'm going to read them both. Are you more liberal than most about accepting donations? I'm told it's a lot of work to catalog and to digitize, and not, not all mephora is wanted. And the second is, how does the homegrown genealogist go about donating information of their family tree and the information they obtain? It seems like they're kind of together. Yeah, um, I am actually pretty liberal because I, I'm a county archive in a very small rural county, and a lot of our history has been thrown away. And so I accept pretty much anything. Now, when it comes to donating your materials, you need to work with the archive or wherever you're wanting to donate them. Talk to them about what they accept, what they don't accept. How do they want it uh, to be donated? I have genealogists that will say, well, I need to organize it first before I donate it. No, don't worry about that because the archivists will place their own organization, how they want it organized on there. Uh, more and more archives are actually accepting more digital content than paper content because of room. They just have, don't have the room to store it. And so if you have a family history, family group sheet, maybe your family tree, offer it digitally. Um, many of these archives are now trying to have these digital databases for genealogists and because they can do the space that way. They can't do a building space. Mm -hmm. um, and this probably relates as well. It sounds like most of the records are not indexed. What are some hints for narrowing searches to improve one's use of time? Well, if you're talking about online, um, I use all kinds of things. I use different terms, different spellings of surnames and things like that. Now, if you're actually talking about sitting down and looking through records that are not indexed, I don't know any tricks to that other than just to read. I have been known to either online, because there are records that are online that you can go through that are not indexed, or at an archive. I've spent hours and hours and hours reading page by page, and this is like newspapers, things like that. Um, and a lot of times I'm rewarded with fantastic information that I find, and sometimes I find nothing. But I'm only going to find it if I go through it and read it. Very good. Um, somebody said they didn't have any questions for you, but they've taken so many notes. They found the <laughs> suggestions very useful. We've gotten a couple of kudos in the comments as well. And somebody said that your list of records is so much longer and more detailed than what's in the handout. Is it possible to get copies of the slides instead or in addition to? I would suggest that you can, I mean, they're going to have this on the website, so you can go back and watch it. Very good. And a few people have asked about that handout, and I'm sure we'll put the link back into the chat for everybody that missed it in the beginning. Um, and here's another question, so it might be a little bit more lengthy. What are your top five archives and why? Oh, wow. Well, I'm very partial to the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Uh, that's my home state archives. Uh, but I just think they're fantastic. The records that they have there are just phenomenal. Uh, and then the next archives, I would say, is the Kentucky State Archives. Uh, they have fantastic records. And then the National Archives, the amount of records that they're putting online, and I'm talking about actually digitized records, is amazing. So the National Archives, I would say, is three. Wow, four or five. Um, I do a lot of my research, my own genealogy research in West Virginia. And so the West Virginia State Archives is a fantastic. They have a great website website and Ohio, uh, any archive in Ohio, because all my family uh, went from West Virginia to Ohio. Uh, and so those two states are I'm pretty partial to. Very good. Um, I don't see any other open questions. This is your last chance if you have a question for Melissa. Otherwise, we might wrap this up. Um, is there anything that came to mind as you answered the questions you want to share with us? You know, it's it's interesting. I find that because I've, I've did genealogy back in the 90s, early 90s, when there wasn't a lot online and we had to go to archives and we had to be patient and go through these records. Um, while there is a tremendous amount of stuff online, I would encourage you to go to these archives websites if you can't travel. Um, talk to them, send them emails, go look at their catalogs and, you know, 
uh, talk to them and, you know, see what kind of records you can actually get them to send you. Uh, archivists are getting better and better about doing that because they may not have digitized records on their website or online, but they may have them digitized in their facility and they can easily just send it to you by email. Um, somebody asked that they live in Maryland, would it benefit them to look into other state archives? And I would think that's a resounding yes. Yes, um, I can tell you from my experience that state archives, uh, state archives actually have records for the states that are around them. Uh, I know that Tennessee tries very hard to get to have records on hand that are the states that are connected to Tennessee. Uh, and so, and also a lot of times you may find records at an archive where what I say, they don't belong. They were donated there by a particular person who may only went to college in that state, but they wanted to just have their papers sent there. And so that's why it's important that we look at collection catalogs on archives websites and look at these finding aids because um, you may find your ancestor someplace where they don't belong. Um. Since COVID, did you notice that there's um, reduced access to any of these archives in person? Um, you know, it's funny. Um, as we were coming out of COVID, uh, a lot of archives were by appointment only. And I have seen, not, not, a, not a lot, but I've seen some archives that have kept that scenario going because they enjoyed the fact of being able to make appointments and spending more time with researchers than having researchers just come in and crowd them. I tell you what else I've seen during COVID is that while you think maybe everybody was at home doing nothing, archivist, uh, they were actually sent home with work <laughs> or they stayed in their facility with their facilities closed. So a lot of things got uh, indexed, a lot of things, a lot of finding aids were done, a lot of digitization was done. And I think over time, you're going to see more and more of that come online, uh, the fruits of that labor. I agree with that. Um, many people are saying in the comment section how they really enjoy the presentation, so much information, um, and somebody even said that they have very few ancestors in the U.S., but they really found your information helpful for their search. Well, um, thank you. Um, you know, I think that um, this type of tips, I think, can work anywhere you do research, uh, and I use things like county archives or state archives. You know, you look at the country that you're researching in and whatever their archives are called, uh, you know, you have to learn the lingo, uh, but the records, if they survive, hopefully you can find them. Well, I appreciate the presentation. Um, I do believe you might be visiting us again later yes. this year. Yeah. Um, so we'll be seeing more of you and have some other topics that you're going to cover for us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out for us and thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, as a reminder, this performance was recorded, as Melissa said, and it's going to be available along with a handout at hcplonline.org. We were asked about that website, so there it is for you. And that's through February 21st. All that information will be online. If you missed yesterday's program, it was what can I do with my DNA? 13 things you can do with your DNA. And that was presented by Peggy Jude. And that presentation is also online, hcplonline.org. And that's gonna be on there for the next few weeks. Our Genealogy Week is continuing this Thursday and Jeanette Shaliga is presenting Beefing Up an Ancestor's Timeline. And you can- I love, I love Jeanette. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I love Jeanette. She is an awesome speaker. Well, glad. glad. Well, you can sign up on hcplonline.org <laughs> and register for that program as well. And so I appreciate, Melissa, your time this evening. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Everyone have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.